Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, we're going to learn about the Fisher information. This thing is an absolutely foundational idea which quantifies the amount of information an observation carries about a parameter. More generally, it provides a general framework for reasoning about parameter uncertainty. It is a frequentist concept, which is kind of a dirty term these days, but it has grown beyond that world. Bayesians and machine learning practitioners love to borrow it for new ideas. To name a few, it's used in the Jeffries prior, natural gradient methods, experimental design, and probably others that I just haven't heard of. So to empower you with this idea, my approach will be to explain the goal of the Fisher information and then show how it's a clever way to achieve that goal. Now, for the sake of a gradual explanation, I'm going to start in the simple one-dimensional case and then generalize to higher dimensions. The higher dimensional case is really what you want for applications. That's where all the cool stuff happens. That said, let's jump in. First, let's say a random variable y is related to a parameter, which is just a single number here, by some known probability density function. We write that generally with this expression, which is here to represent any function that accepts both an observation of y and a parameter value, and then gives us a number, which tells us the likelihood of that observation according to that parameter. Now, here's the question. According to whatever this thing is, how well does an observation of y locate the parameter value that produced it? In fact, the goal is to measure how well an observation locates that parameter. Now, if you're like me, the vagueness of this goal makes it hard to imagine what a solution would even look like. But what does help me is to consider cases at two extremes. For the first case, let's use the normal distribution with a large variance. What I mean by that is p of y given theta is the normal density function where our theta is the mean of the normal and we assume we know the variance which we'll set to a relatively high value of 25. For the other case, we'll consider the exact same thing, except with a small variance of one. Very, very frequently, when we want to go from observations to parameter estimates, we consider the log likelihood function. To show that, I'm going to simulate data according to the large variance case first. And then, for each observation, draw the log likelihood function. Each one of these lines tells us how likely one of our observations is as we vary our mean parameter along the horizontal axis. Keep in mind, the data is generated according to some parameter value, which I haven't told you. We'll call that value the true parameter value. Naturally, let's consider the small variance case as well. Okay, now, take a step back and look at these two cases. I have not told you the true parameter value, but you tell me, in which case would you have an easier time guessing that parameter value? Isn't it obvious? It's clearly the right side the small variance case. Effectively, each line shows one observation's vote of where the true parameter is. In this case, all observations overlap on a narrow range, making it easier to pinpoint that value. As you may be able to guess, that true parameter value is five. Going forward, we'll refer to that true value as mu star. And so we might say that in the small variance case, our observations provide more information about where mu star is. In fact, I should emphasize, when we say information, it's this narrowness that we're after. Honestly, this view is all you need to understand the goal of the Fisher information. But now, separately, the question becomes, how does the Fisher information turn this narrowness into a number? How do we measure that information? For that, we'll need a new view. First, let's redraw what we just saw. Here, we're showing the small variance case. Next, let's pick a parameter value, totally arbitrarily, to plug into these functions. I'll call this evaluation point mu naught. If we plug mu naught in, we'll get back a big list of numbers. Over here, we'll see an estimated distribution of those numbers. Finally, we're in a position to see the key idea of the Fisher information. The idea is to consider the slopes of these functions at our evaluation point. If we recall a smidge of calculus, we know the functions that generate these slopes are the derivatives, which we can draw as well. In general, the derivative of a log likelihood with respect to the parameters has a special name. We call them score functions. As you could see, in this case, the score functions happen to be linear. As we'll see, all the action hangs out in the distribution of scores at our evaluation point. So, just like we did below, let's show that distribution along with the mean line of that distribution. To get a feel, let's move around the evaluation point a bit. The first thing I bet you'll notice is the shape of the slopes distribution stays the same. Well, please ignore that observation. That comes from the fact that the normal distribution has linear score functions, and that's not true in other non-normal cases. 
But there is one thing that generalizes to all other cases. When we evaluate these score functions at the true parameter value, the mean of the scores is zero. To provide some real simple intuition, the average score is zero at the true point because it has to be. If it wasn't, the data would be suggesting a more likely parameter value is somewhere else. But in this setup, that can't be. The most likely parameter value must be our true parameter value because it generated our data. And now we're just about ready to see the Fisher information. But I want you to guess what it is. To help, I'm going to move between our two cases. We're starting in the informative case with a small variance. Now let's increase it. Hmm. Getting any ideas? Anything jumping out? It seems to me in the informative case, there is a wider variance in the scores. In the uninformative case, there is a small variance, which means they are all hanging around zero. To gain some intuition, think about what a single small score value is telling you. If it's 0.001, that means that data point recommends shifting mu by a thousand if you'd like to increase the log likelihood by one. If it's minus 0.001, it's saying you need to shift mu by a thousand in the other direction. So a lot of score values huddled around zero collectively tell you to move nowhere, but individually provide wildly different recommendations about where the true value lives. In other words, a small variance of the scores implies a large range of possible mu values. This is the key idea behind the Fisher information. And finally, we can state its definition. The Fisher information is the variance of these score functions when we evaluate them at the true parameter value. In other words, it's a measure of the width of this distribution when it's centered on zero. To put it on the screen, I'll show two times the square of the Fisher information as this horizontal width. Now look, as we move between the uninformative and informative cases, the Fisher information follows naturally. And hopefully you can feel mechanically what's going on. Remember, the goal of the Fisher information is to measure narrowness. And this does precisely that. As we become more narrow, the slopes vary more widely and the Fisher information increases. But there's more, as you may have guessed from this big empty space. Let's once again consider the slopes at our evaluation point, but this time of the score functions. In fact, in the exact same way the middle row relates to the bottom row, let's create a top row which relates to the middle row. That means we'll plot the second derivatives and an estimated density of the second derivatives at the evaluation point. As you could tell, in this normal distribution case, the second derivative is constant. Okay, and now I can state this result. The Fisher information, which is the variance of the scores, is also, if it exists, equal to the negative expected value of the second derivatives. Now, the normal distribution isn't a great case to show that, since the second derivative is always one value. So let's transform it into a weirder case where that isn't true. And now we can see it. Now, you may reasonably ask, why is this true? Well, I will avoid the proof because I do not know it, but I can offer intuition. Basically, you expect a wide variance in your slopes if your slopes are changing a lot. Slopes that are changing a lot have extreme slopes themselves, meaning the average second derivative is extreme. So it's not crazy to imagine the expected second derivative is the variance of the slopes. Now, that wordy explanation may not do it for you. In that case, just try to feel the mechanics between extremes. When the observations make it easy to locate a parameter, your slopes vary a lot. When they vary a lot, the average second derivative is extreme. Now, the view I've given so far is a bit too simple to be useful. I don't think anyone really cares about the one-dimensional case. So let's generalize all the way to two dimensions. I'll do that by doing the exact same exercise, except we'll be using a 2D multivariate normal. The parameters in this case will be the vector of two means and we'll assume the covariance matrix is known, just like we assumed the variance was known in the earlier case. Since two dimensions is a heavier lift visually, we can't show all six of these graphs. So we'll generalize only two of them. The first will be the one showing the log likelihood curves and their slopes. And the second will be the distribution of those slopes. Ready? All right, let's jump back into the black abyss. Now, let's think. In the 1D case, the x-axis was our one dimensional parameter space. Now we need to generalize that to a 2D parameter space. Okay, let's draw that with the true parameter point called out. The next thing we need to do is draw a 2D version of those log likelihood curves we saw earlier. Let's think. Those curves received a single parameter value as input and gave us back a log likelihood. 
Now they need to accept two parameter values. So we could think of the 2D version as domes that cover this 2D plane. And typically, such things are represented with contour lines like this. Next, we need a 2D version of a slope. Those told us how changing the parameter value at a point would change the log likelihood. The analogy in higher dimensions is the gradient vector. That's a line that looks like this. The gradient vector tells you the direction you should choose if you want to increase the function as much as possible. The length of the gradient tells you how much the function will increase if you take that step. Earlier, we didn't play with just one likelihood function, we played with many, one for each observation sampled using the true parameter. So to avoid a blizzard of contoured lines, I'll represent one likelihood function with a single ellipse. And now we can represent many. So staring at the setup, can you guess what the 2D Fisher information will tell us? Seriously, pause the video and scratch your head on this one. It's worth thinking about. Just try to carry the analogy from 1D to 2D. Done? Okay, let's do it. In the 1D case, the Fisher information told us the variance of the log likelihood slopes. More generally, it's describing the distribution of those slopes. Now in this case, we need to describe the distribution of these gradient vectors. To do that, let's plot the 2D histogram of these vectors. If a square is bright, that means there are a lot of gradient vectors with the coordinates of that square. With that, I can say, whatever the 2D Fisher information is, it's going to describe this histogram. Before I tell you it, I should point something out. On the left, the gradients randomly point out from the center. They don't agree on any one direction. In the 1D case, we saw this behavior as the slopes averaging out to zero. To refresh, this is because we are evaluating our gradients at the true parameter value from which all our observations are generated. If we were evaluating at a point that wasn't the true parameter vector, these gradients would favor one direction over the other and the Fisher information wouldn't apply. With that, let's think about what this Fisher information must do. We need to describe this 2D histogram centered at zero. In the 1D case, it was the variance. Some of you who know your stats may be able to guess it. It's the covariance matrix. It's a square grid of numbers that describes how elements of a vector sampled from a distribution vary together. So in this case, the higher dimensional Fisher information is the covariance matrix of the gradient vectors. I can just show you. The Fisher information tells us this ellipse. How it tells us that ellipse isn't important. Think of it as a compact summary of this histogram, and then let's just focus on that histogram. To get a feel, let's consider the simplest case, where the gradient elements aren't correlated. In this case, the variance of each gradient element is all there is to know. And we can interpret each of those in much the same way we did in the 1D case. If that gradient vector element varies a lot, we can nail down the parameter associated with it very well. Now, let's introduce some serious correlation. To intuit this, let's consider only parameter values that fall on this red strip. The question is, if you were only looking at parameter values here, could you easily determine which ones are likely to be near the truth? I mean, yeah, it looks like it would be easy. The observations only fall on a small piece of this diagonal line, and it's no accident. This is also a direction the histogram varies quite a bit. In other words, a direction in which the gradients vary widely is a direction where you can easily separate likely from unlikely true parameter values. And it's for exactly the same curvature reasons we saw in the 1D case. As you can guess, a direction like this is where we have difficulty determining the true parameter values. And this is a direction along which gradients don't vary much at all. This is the Fisher information. It's telling us how well observations will separate likely from unlikely true parameter values along any given direction, and it does that using the distribution of slopes at the true parameter values. But what about the second derivative stuff? Does that work here too? Yes, 100%. There's a higher dimensional analogy of the second derivative called the Hessian, and the expected negative Hessian turns out to be equal to our gradients covariance matrix. Though showing that would be tricky, but stating it, that's easy. In fact, we should restate everything with the glory math. After all, my goal is to help you apply this stuff. These visuals are nice and all, but to be useful, they need to connect to the papers and textbooks that handle this beast. Ready? Okay. The Fisher information is a measure of the amount of information an observation of a random variable carries about a parameter according to the probability function that relates them. It's defined with this expression, which I'll break down. First, we write it as a function of a true parameter value, which is theta star, to generalize it beyond a specific true parameter. 
Second, this means the variance of something that depends on y, where the random behavior of y is according to that theta star. Third, this means we'll be evaluating each score function at the true theta, giving us a bunch of numbers of which we are interested in their variance. And as we mentioned, the variance turns out to be equal to the negative expected value of the second derivative. These two expressions communicate everything we covered with those six panels we saw earlier. Sidebar, I just want to point out, this is why mathematical notation is so useful. With a very compact expression, we can communicate a big idea very precisely. Next, let's move on to the multidimensional case. I covered it in 2D, but just take it as given that those same ideas generalize to n dimensions. Ready? Okay. The higher dimensional form is called the Fisher information matrix, which generalizes the Fisher information to handle a vector of parameters rather than a single one. In this case, the matrix is a square grid of numbers where the ith row and jth com are given by this expression. If this expression looks unfamiliar, that's because this is a different way to write covariance. Since the expected partial derivative with respect to any parameter is zero, we can write their covariance as this expected product. It just falls from the definition of covariance. If this algebra looks like a lot, that's fine. It's not important to internalize it. What is important is to know the overall statement, which I'm about to say. The Fisher information matrix is the covariance matrix of the log likelihood gradient with respect to the parameters when we evaluate that gradient at the true parameter vector and the randomness comes from that true parameter vector. Whew, that's a lot. Okay, let's also say that last part regarding the Hessian. That is, an element of the Fisher information matrix also turns out to be equal to the negative expected value of the second partial derivative for the two parameters associated with that element. If that's also hard to digest, just think in terms of that 1D graphic and trust that it works in higher dimensions. And that's all of it. If you have any questions, please comment and I'll do my best to answer. Anything worth clarifying after the fact, I'll include in the description. Also, there you'll find my go-to sources on this topic in case you want to learn more. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Content like this is the content I'll continue to make, especially if I can get your support.